And so one night I was tucking Jude in the bed, my eight year old son, and he just said, you know, we were talking about why I do this. And he just said, well, why do you do this, Dad? And I know he knows about this. I know he knows about me going out, but why do you do this? And I said, you know, Jude, there's four things. And as I said four, and I remember holding my, my, my fingers up, and I remember thinking, wow, I have to do more, not out of guilt. There was not a guilt in that. It was go, and then it says, and make disciples. And so it was like, but what the heck does that word even mean? Make, what do you mean make disciples? Like when I hear that word make, I'm thinking, I'm serious. I'm thinking about baking. You're, you're taking ingredients and you're making something. I wanted to know what that, what did that look like? For a person that I encountered on the street, so as I'm talking to Jude, I'm like, go make disciples, baptizing and teaching. All four of those that night when I'm tucking my own son into his bed, it was like, Kyle, you need to do all four of those. It was like, Kyle, you need to learn what it means to make disciples. The world is totally out discipling churches. Tim Keller put it this way, the average Christian is in a social media bubble for five to seven hours a day, and they're only getting uh, to church you know, for an hour or two a week. Who's gonna win? For the last month, uh, I felt prompted by the Spirit of God to go share the gospel every day. For the last 13 years, I have personally never ever said to the Lord, I'm gonna go do this every single day. And you see that whole month, Time Revive had partnered with various ministries, really in the United States, but really across the world that said that people were gonna go share the, the gospel. They were gonna go and share the gospel. And, I was kind of like, yeah, I'll do it, but not every day. You know, not in my mind, because that's a big commitment. And I remember when I fell on my knees, it was so clear, the Holy Spirit just, Kyle, I want you to go out every day and share the gospel. And I knew that my life was gonna change because of those 31 days. There was a joy behind it. Like there was such a joy, even like on Saturdays and Sundays, like when you were like, okay, this is my family time, right? You know, like separate from Monday through Friday. I, I couldn't wait to go out on Saturdays and Sundays. It was always an adventure. And it really didn't feel forced, actually, ever. Any follower of Christ, a person who is a pupil or an adherent of the doctrines of another. So like a, a, a pupil to a teacher. It's someone who is in training, following, emulating the lifestyle of another. A disciple is somebody who follows Jesus, is changed by Jesus, and is committed to the mission of Jesus. The invitation from the beginning was follow me. That implies you must believe me. You're not gonna follow someone who's leading you in the wrong direction. That implies that as long as you're following me, you're gonna always learn. There's more beyond than what you know today. So that's why I like to think of myself as a disciple of Christ, I'm a learner still. The Barnett Group completed a study, and here's what happened. In the year 2010, 50% of Americans claimed to be practicing Christians. The same study was done last year, and that number had gone from 50% of Americans claiming to be practicing Christians to 25% of Americans claiming to be practicing Christians. I'm just asking if we could pray for people. If you had one, one simple prayer request, that's it. Well, let me pray at Jacob, right? But Lord, I just, I pray for these things that Jacob has shared and Lord, that people would honor one another, that they'd respect one another. Even if you're not a Christian, if you had one thing that I could pray for you about. That's fine. I follow a different thing. Yeah, no, that's okay though. Like, totally okay. But if you said, hey, pray for me about this, what would you say? Is there anything in particular? Really. What faith do you follow? Hinduism. Okay, what was your first name? Mayuk. Mayuk? Kyle, good to meet you, man. All right, bless you, have a good day. For an hour, every day, I'm just going around asking people if you had one prayer request. That's it. One prayer request? Yeah, but I love the Lord. I saw you sitting here bouncing the volleyball, <laughs> and I was like, well, you're not going anywhere for a little bit. I thought I'd ask. Oh, your mom would label you as a non-believer. Would she say you're non-believer because, why? How would, why would she label you as that, do you think? Just not my question. Just simply questions. Yeah. 
I, well, one thing I was question is like, why don't we go to church? I don't like why. Like, there's nothing in the Bible that says we have to go to church. Hey, can I ask you a random question? I got my little boy Jude. He's in second grade. We're just going around asking people if we could pray, if we if we could do one prayer for you. Evangelism, a hundred percent. Like he's calling all of us to do this. He calls the body of Christ to not be ashamed to go out and make disciples. He calls all of us to do that. But sometimes it's just like in any other discipline. You have to train yourself to do this. In other words, like put it on your calendar and say, okay, once a week, I'm gonna do this. We did that every day. Four o'clock, we're gonna hit the streets unless we had something scheduled differently. Unless you do that, I think it's really hard for people to begin to share the gospel in their own environment. You have to calendar out just to get started. The word evangelism is not in the Bible. You have preaching the gospel in the, in, the, in the Bible, but the word evangelism is not there. And the word discipleship's not in the Bible either. So you have these two words, evangelism and discipleship, that are not in the Bible. Sometimes I think we do it all wrong. I, I think that, um, how can I put this? Um, we go to school, I went to school, went to college, you know, and have all these degrees. But people who's hurting, they're not looking for all that. They're not looking for, you know, you have a master's in this or associates or bachelor's in that. They're hurting. They just want to feel love. Uh, even for me growing up, it was about head knowledge. It was about how much scripture could you learn, how much, uh, how well can you perform. So, like I've got a million trophies sitting in my garage somewhere of memory verse competition champion or all that. And that was what discipleship was, was like all the stuff that you did, it wasn't who you were becoming. It wasn't like a heart transformation, life transformation. So I think, uh, we, I think we become satisfied with information, not with heart change, and not with a radical life change that is saying, all right, Jesus, what are you calling me to do today? And being obedient to Jesus in that context. If disciple making does not include lost people, it will stifle itself because it becomes a conversation about people who are saved and who are trying out to, they're trying to live out a kingdom vision of life that does not include people that are lost and going to hell that Jesus came to die for. We typically define loving the Lord as doing things for the Lord. So the Great Commission is one of the ways we love Him. We're gonna go do things for Him. What do we do? We make disciples. And so we're, we're almost born a, into this mission of I'm gonna, I'm gonna do the great commandment, which is loving Him by executing the Great Commission, which is going out and doing things for Him. And I, I feel like one of the ways we need to rewire ourselves as disciples is learning to sit at His feet together. And for us, sitting at the feet of Jesus, loving Him, worshiping Him, ministering to Him, has created a context for us to create disciples that first love Him, which then bears the fruit of us loving others. <laughs> so how can we pray for you today? Uh, Have well, you been asked that in a while? Mm, kind of. Uh, I was calling my grandma yesterday and she yeah. was saying how she's always praying for me every single night in cool. my family. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Lord, we just say thanks for allowing us to meet Sydney. And God, we ask for her well-being. I, I, I think at the end of the day, a Bible's a good morality lesson for yeah. kids. You know, but to be a good person and to have faith and believe that somebody bigger than you puts you here. Yeah, I'm gonna pray for some divine appointments today. Jesus, that you would make a way, just like you did yesterday, of somebody that is just ready. I love this. It matches your wristband. Oh, okay. So it's a Bible. Thank you. Oh yeah, I like that. It matches the wristband. So when you go through... So I know where to go. Yeah. Okay. When you go through it, so if you look at the yellow. Yeah. Okay, can I do this real quick? Can yeah. I give you the five words? Go ahead. Okay, so when you put your thumb on number one, okay, right here, and then you open it up, okay? You're gonna see the verse that's highlighted on your wristband. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, so you got that, Matthew? Yep, yeah. you got it right there. Okay, Jessica, you wanna read that first one? For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Okay, so I'm gonna give you five words. The first word is sin. 
Okay, here's the deal. Everybody sins. Dude, there's no way perfect, right? Okay, that's all that, that says. Okay, you go to number two. Okay, you wanna read that one out loud? And remember, that's the same as now on your verse on your wristband. Uh, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Would you like a wristband? Sure. Here, it's a Bible. There you go. You know, God demonstrates his own love towards us. In, the, in that while we get sinners, Christ died for us. Okay, yeah. so this Bible says, for by grace, so what that means is that God's pouring out his favor on you, on all of us, regardless if we want it or not, he, God gives us his grace, okay? And it says, so because of God's grace, you have been saved. So you're saved from the death and the sin, the Bible says, when you have faith. 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 When you believe. Oh, believe. Okay, so when you believe that Jesus love. died, God's love, the sin and death are gone. It's pretty cool, isn't it? Yeah. It says that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting, resulting in righteousness and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. Got it. Mm. So what's the last word? Uh, life. Life. So when somebody says, Jesus, I want you, I want you to be my Lord, you get life. I look at how, how did Jesus do it? So if we're to go and make disciples, did he have disciples? And what did his relationship with his disciples look like? And I think we would understand what Jesus meant by making disciples at looking at how Jesus actually made disciples. Well, by following him, they were, of course, learning. That's what the word disciple translates in the Greek, the learner. But it also meant they were going someplace. And the one who was leading them was the Son of God. He was Jesus, the Word incarnate. So they had full confidence in the journey. It's been a roller coaster. It's had its ups and downs. I'm slowly going up right now, so, yeah. Can I tell you my side of the story of this with you? Yeah. This is hard, by the way. Like, everything about this is hard. Not because I don't love Stephanie and Leon and their family. I have a family. I have life. I have a whole different side of things that they don't even know about. But, but I'm, I'm committed. So when he says, pray for the Lord of Harvest to send laborers, why do you think he calls it labor? It's work. Just the Holy Spirit breathe in fun and exciting ways. So Jesus, we give this to you. You know, I remember we were driving down Beltline Road and uh, Jude was with us. And as we were driving down, it's a classic, we call it the Revive U Turn. I remember we pulled up and we parked. And at that moment, this is where I'm talking about listening to the Holy Spirit. I remember specifically asking, Holy Spirit, who do you want me to talk to? And so I literally was walking this direction towards one, there was a lady over here at the table, and then there was a, a younger man over here. He had headphones in. So naturally, as I'm asking the Lord, like I started to walk this way, but I remember, Lord, is that who you want me to talk to? Is this lady? And he said, no, go talk to the young man. I had the trust that I heard from him, even though he had headphones on. Like, I don't want to be that weird guy. Hey. <laughs> so as Jude walks up with me, as you walk up, you know, having the camera is always a little bit different. People are always a little bit like, eh. But he was super laid back. Kelvin was his name. Well, so how can we pray for you, man? What, what would be one thing that's on your mind? Uh, it's crazy because um, you know, my uh, my grandma actually died uh, on the 22nd. Hmm. So that was a, a pretty pretty big thing. Well, let's say a prayer for you, can we? I'll pray for yes, them, is that all right, and their family? Okay, well, just down by us, okay? Well, Lord, we just say thanks for a, a new friend named Kelvin. And God, we pray, Lord, that you would comfort his family as they're grieving the loss of Medea, his grandmother. Allow him to bring back memories of his grandmother and encourage him. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. But whenever we're done praying with people, uh, we always give them a, a wristband. So do you mind if I give you, can we tell you what those five colors mean? 
Is that all right? Yes, sir. <laughs> you know, I encourage you. So if you can, if you're up for reading that one. For by the grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Okay, so your fourth word is what you said, it's faith. So when you have faith in what Christ did for us on the cross, sin and death are gone. Okay. That makes sense? Dang, that's deep. Wait, can you, can you explain that? Can you explain that a little bit more? <laughs> sure. So, okay, look at this. See how it says you're not saved from works? You see how it says that? Mm -hmm. Which means you're not saved based on being a good person or being kind to other people. Those are all good things. But he says you're saved by receiving the gift, which is Christ dying on the cross. So by faith, if you receive this gift in his love, right? Sin and death are gone. Oh, wow. That makes sense? Yeah. So, yeah. I've been meaning to to get back into reading the Bible like like I used to because the Bible, I know the Bible is really a key to life. I heard you say it, but I, I always got to ask. I mean, do you remember a time when you surrendered your life to the Lord? Um, I think I was about your son's age, like eight or nine, okay. something like that. No, the Bible would say that's when you were born again. So like you become a, a spiritual baby, right? The challenge is, is you know, as you grow with him, do you just keep drinking milk or do you start eating solid food? You need an outlet to grow. Yep. Otherwise, you'll stay as an eight year old born again, but never grow in the Lord. You don't want to be that guy, right? That said, I trusted you, but I never got to know you. That's, that's neat. Too. Well, maybe, what, maybe what we do is we just schedule some kind of meal. I bring out some food. And we just hang out and talk. Okay. Just start that journey. Well, let's connect this week. This week? Yeah. All right, cool. Why cool. not? I mean, it's, sounds good. And so we exchanged information. And uh, honestly, it was a couple days later, we met with him again. And I think what's so cool is, I mean, he literally lives like a mile from my house. Um, comes from a different background than I would. And I wanted to see if he'd be willing to allow me to pour into him with the Word of God. And you never know unless you ask. And he was one of those individuals that we exchanged information. And the next thing you know, a couple days later, we're meeting outside of a wing bucket, <laughs> having wings and talking about more of his background in his life. <laughs> How long you go? This week? <laughs> oh, I like that. So that's it. It yeah, just I encourages people. Man, if you continue to walk with the Lord, like you can really impact people. It's pretty awesome, but it's a matter of believing in yourself that he's actually called you to something. I really believe it, actually. Uh, I was telling my friend, and just like within like the past few weeks, like things have been happening, like spiritual things, like in my life. And then to add on top of that, with like you, you know, approaching me at the park, just kind of confirmed it even more. And now I was telling them, and even my brothers too, it's just things just kind of just are, are like different. Like, like I feel like, you know, I know that they're different. Something is tugging at your heart for more, right? Would you agree? Yeah, most definitely. What do you think that is? I say mainly getting into getting into the Bible more, not not necessarily just like reading it, but like you know more like understanding it and applying it to my daily life. Like he had questions, and we just started dialoguing about the Word. And I, I remember talking about. Um, like if you want to get to know Jesus, you need to get to know the Word. I remember having this conversation because in John 1, In the beginning was a Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Okay, so what's interesting about this definition, okay, at this point we don't know what the Word is. Does that make sense? Because it says in the beginning was the Word, the Word was, uh, the word was with God. And then it says the Word was God. <laughs> it's kind of weird. Yeah, kind of, yeah, just that, kind of put like that. So then the question is, is what's the word? You got any thoughts? Uh, to me, simply just, uh, I mean, whatever, whatever God says the word is. Okay, good. So let's go to the next one. I'm going to show you exactly what it says. Okay, so I want you to go to John 1, 14, same chapter. Okay. 
there. This will kind of all start tying it together for you. Read verse 14, will you? And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So think about this way. God sent his son Jesus to be here on earth, right? Does that make sense? So Jesus, who is God, took on flesh. So if you go back to John 1, 14, the word became flesh. So Jesus is the word. Wow. Okay. Oh, wow. Okay, so why is that important? Because if you want to get to know the word, you know what you're saying? If you want to get to know the word, you got to get to know Jesus. Okay. That's it. So as you're saying, I, I want to go deeper. I want to get to know. You're ultimately saying, I want to get to know him. And then Jesus will begin to direct you through the Holy Spirit. Dang, I don't, I don't think I ever had it put like that. <laughs> I don't think I ever had it put like that. <laughs> Sorry, somebody did it for me, so I'm just passing it on. <laughs> and I remember just at that moment, he, he said, it was like, that's deep, man. That's deep, that's profound. I've never heard that. And I think at that moment, I was like, you know, this kid's hungry for more. You know, Jesus says, go therefore and make disciples. It's one thing for me to talk to you at the pond and say, man, get closer to the Lord. But it's another thing to say, you know, Kelvin, I want you to look more like Christ. That's discipleship. And to me, that's how we're gonna see a move of God in this country, is when people are taking the word seriously and then impacting others with it. I mean, that, that's just amazing. I mean, I feel like I feel like that's what it's all about. I mean, just like, not only just knowing what you know and you know, being into a Bible yourself, but showing other people like what you know, or we said someone taught you. So teaching people what has been taught to you, and then hopefully one day I could teach somebody what all well, you taught to me. And I was excited because after that first meal over wings, it showed me here's an individual that wants to know Christ more. And I want us to say something though. Uh, never once did I say, hey, come to this specific church or go to that specific denomination. I never once said like, hey, you have to be a part of this church body. I just wanted to introduce them to Jesus. I just wanted to introduce them to the word. And a lot of people might be like, see, there it is. Somebody's going against the church. Man, I am totally for the church. I'm for the church. I'm a part of the church. But I want to equip believers in such a way that they want to be around more people, that they want to be around like-minded, the body of Christ. And so, super important to me to establish that seed in good soil. I feel like I go out and I talk to different individuals and the ones that are saying, no, no, it's like, I've got too much, I've got my work, I'm too busy, I'm fine. And so then it's almost like for me, I'm gonna go to whoever is receptive to the gospel. I'm not saying that you can't just, hey, let me tell you about the Lord. People have come to know the Lord through that method. I just, when I study the life of Christ in the Gospels, I really see a process. And I think it's a process that the, the body of Christ believers need to hear as they engage their own neighbors. And it's, it really is love them first. Don't speak into them. Don't communicate to them in such a way that you're a hierarchy. Just love them. And then in that process of loving, you know what it does? It allows you to listen to them. But so many people come in with such an agenda that they're like, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do this, doesn't matter how these people are. So it's love and listen. And then the Holy Spirit, when I hear from the Holy Spirit, that's not weird, you guys. Remember in John 10 says, my sheep hear my voice, he will speak to you. So I would say discernment. So if I'm talking to two of our friends on a front porch of an apartment, the discernment allows me to see how to respond. And what I mean by that is, is I didn't automatically say, hey, let's do a Bible study. Hey, let's get you to church. You know what he, he showed me to do? Go get her some diapers for her five month old. Like go get her some pizzas for her, her family. It, it's, it's different for every scenario, but then that love, listen, discern and respond allows you to make disciples. Can we ask you a random question? This is my little boy, Jude. This is Drew. We live like two miles. 
So one hour a day for the whole month of May, we're just going around asking people if you had a prayer request. Oh. Anything come to your mind? Oh. Yeah? My your sister? I Pray for myself, my help. What's your first name? Maxine. Maxine? Maxine. Okay. All right, Lord, we just say thanks for this sweet family today. And God, on this Mother's Day, I pray that you would bless them. Lord, that you would, and we know you can do this, that you would remove the cancer from Miss Betty. God, that any discomfort that she's going through, would you restore her health in the name of Jesus? And then I pray for Maxine and her health. I pray, Lord, that you would strengthen her. And then, Lord, for every person here, I pray that they sense your presence right now. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank, Amen. Thank you very much. much. Okay, I, I, pock, I, uh, I filled my pocket with little wristbands. I'm going to say thank you. Okay, so thank this you. has uh, five Bible verses on it. Oh. Who wants to read the last verse? I don't have any volunteers. The green one. That if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him for the dead, from the dead, you will be saved. Yes. Here's what this means. It doesn't just mean I believe, I said it 15 years ago, it means I want him to change who I am. Yeah. So is there anybody here that said, man, I want this today? We all want it today. That's right. Sometimes the Holy Spirit just kind of like prompts me. What are you thinking right now? You have a really, uh, you have a, a humble heart. Have you ever surrendered to him? Would you like to? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for your honesty. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. And at that moment, I remember the Spirit of God said, start asking him individually, not corporately. Would you like to today? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Amen. Would you like to today? You have in your mind, and I think this a lot, like, did that person just say that culturally? Did that person just say that to be polite? You know, did that person just, well, let's just get this kid out of here. Let's just say yes. Would you like to today? Yes, I would. Amen. Lord, I know I'm a sinner, but I thank you for your son, Jesus, who died on the cross for my sin and rose on the third day so that my sins could be forgiven and I could be with you forever. Thank you for loving me. I'm ready to follow you and give you my life. The Bible says literally as of today, you are born again. Can I get your guys' just info? Mm -hmm. I want to make sure I'm connected with you guys. What a blessing. Mm -hmm. Alright, I'll text you guys photos. Okay. And then just some things to bring through. It's crazy going out every day in your neighborhood. You get accustomed to your normal streets, you get accustomed to your cul-de-sacs, you get accustomed to your friends. But man, these 31 days brought a whole new awareness of who really is in my neighborhood. And two of them were two young ladies, Stephanie and Alyssa. My little boy Jude and I, we live like a mile from here. We're just going around for an hour asking people if, if you had like one prayer request, if we could pray for you guys. Is that all right? Okay, cool. Thanks. It's like financially. Financially? Yeah. Did you have a job or just, do you have a job? No, I'm not working right now. Okay. But I have kids, so it's kind of hard. How many do you have? I have two. Oh, what are their ages? I can um, two and five months. Yeah. That's a busy age. Busy mm -hmm. mom. Yeah. And I, I have brothers too, and one of them is autistic, so it's kind of hard for my mom too right now. Do you all live together? Mm -hmm. How many are in your house? Like, I have four brothers, and then two of my kids, me and her, and then. Do you live there too? Yes. Yeah. What? They both found each other friends, and that's really all they are is just good friends. Uh, they found each other at this place um, for runaways. This was their words. Wait, so that's like 15 people. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll pray for that. I will. Okay, Alyssa, how, how about for you? Um, for me, it's just, I'm, I was addicted to drugs, so it's like recovery from that. Okay. Just to be sober and clean and get my life back on track. How long have you been sober? Let's say, Seven months. Three. Have you ever stopped before in the past and then did it again? So is there any chance that that could happen again? See, Just the reason why no. it's, All right. the reason, the reason, well, the reason why I'm seeing this is because when I was an addict, 
in order for me to stop, I ended up turning to something else, and it was Christ. Yeah. And and I so I gave him everything because when I would try to do it on my own, I could stop from time to from time to time. But then I'd go back to it, yeah. and it, and it's because I was still missing the main puzzle piece, and I was Jesus in my life. Tony, I'll pray for Stephanie. If you want to pray for Alyssa, yes. okay. You want to go first, Tony? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, Lord, I just want to lift up Alyssa. I just, uh, Father God, I just pray that you would uh, be speaking to her, Lord, and you would just, uh, in time of needs, that you would just uh, whisper to her that she don't need um, that nasty stuff and just give her the power to say no in those time of needs. And Father, I just pray a blessing over and I just pray you would continue to help her uh, stay clean with Jesus. So God, I just say thank you uh, for who she is. And I pray that you'd give her strength as a mama when she's tired when she's growing a little bit weaker and doesn't have a, the energy to keep going. Fill her up, God, and allow her to keep pressing on as a mom. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. <laughs> All right, we're going to give you, this is cool. Can I just get, tell you what the five words mean? Is that okay? Mm -hmm. On your wristband? Yeah. And Jude's going to get, Jude's always our little delivery guy. He loves this. He loves this. He loves this. Okay, thank, thank you. you. So he says, when you have faith in what he did on the cross, the sin and the death are gone. Mm -hmm. That is possible. I mean, would you like to surrender to him? Yes. Why, why would you want to surrender to him? I just need a break. You need a break. Yeah. So, okay, you're going to really freak out on this. But I'm okay with it. <laughs> I want you to break. And I want you just to say, if, if you really are surrendering to him, tell him. I want to surrender to you and find peace and find comfort and let all of us find peace and comfort and understanding throughout this life. Father God, give us the patience to deal with anything that is too big for us and be there when we are down. And just thank you, Father God. Father God, I'm praying to you now to surrender myself to you. Um, it's really hard. Um, Father God, I need help. I need guidance. I need rest. I have two kids that I love very much and I don't want to give up on right now, Lord. Father God, I pray that you protect me and my family. As we're going through this hard time right now, I pray that these people here with us are protected as well. Lord, thank you for having them come over here and talk to me today where I wouldn't be here. Lord, and I also thank you for waking me up, me and my kids up this morning. Please, Lord, please. I need guidance. Huh? Amen. Yeah. That was awesome. <laughs> Just came right here. <laughs> <laughs> Same thing, man. Same thing, that whole compassion thing. God. You know, you have uh, 10 people living in a two bedroom apartment. 10. And uh, we just felt prompted uh, to go. Maya and I, my oldest, we went out and we, we got her. Through the help of Tom Revive, we got her help of, you know, diapers for her kids. We got her some baby food. We got them some pizzas. What are things that I'd like, right? You know, and just dropped it off. No strings attached. Didn't ask her for anything. Didn't make the connection for any. I mean, nothing, nothing. It was just love them. It goes back to those words that we talked about. Love and listen. What are their needs? And then you discern how can I help? And then you respond accordingly to the Holy Spirit. And so it's this hearing and then understanding in a way that I can walk it out and so what a lot of people don't see is it's not always just this Bible studies, you guys. It's not just this discipleship of like, hey, let me preach the word. <laughs> yeah, live it, man. And so we just kept showing up, randomly bringing things, and they were so blessed. And so I, I got the boldness and just said, would you guys, Stephanie, Alyssa, would you guys be willing to go through the word with us? Would you be willing to do a Bible study? Yes. When I think of the story of David, and I, I think we were probably going on like an hour and a half of just like no interactions. We came up to the stoplight next to the Walmart and there was a little sign right there. I just remember it motivated us to keep going. Cause I remember I said to Drew, Drew, look that sign. I go, let, 
I go, just give me 10 more minutes, 10 more minutes. Let's just keep going. So we pulled over into this little apartment complex, pulled into the parking lot because there's two ladies sitting at a bus stop. Hello. Can I ask you a question? We live a mile from here and uh, we're going around just for an hour, just praying for neighbors in our neighborhood. I'm sorry? We don't live in this area. Oh, well that, okay. All right, that's fine then. Bless you guys. As I was walking back to the car, I, I turned around for a split second and there's this young kid coming down the, the Coit Road just walking. And I, I just remember just standing there and I remember very clearly from the Holy Spirit just said, wait, there's a guy coming. He's coming our way. Hey, can we ask you a quick question? And the next thing you know, there's this young kid named David from Honduras, 17 years old, uh, no family, uh, no job, no money. Where are you from? Uh, Honduras. Honduras. Yeah. So you speak Spanish? Yes. Yeah. In, in Espanol? Yeah. Okay. In Espanol. Uh, here, Jude, go get it in there for him. Okay, so, okay, so in the, on this. Yeah. So, uh, uh, if you go to Amarillo. Amarillo. Amarillo? Yeah, Amarillo. So Amarillo es pecado. Oh. So everybody, Honduras, Americans, yeah. we all sin. A lot of people, mucho. Si. Sí. Everybody. Everybody. You got it, David. Yeah. Fans, Cristo. Si. Sí. Si. Sí. Sí. Not, not uh, works, not trabajos. Oh. Fe. En su Cristo. Si. Sí. Okay. okay. Yeah. Tengo fe en Jesucristo. Yo. You. Si. Sí. Tu. Sí. Awesome. So then you have and Spiritu Santo inside. Amen. Okay. Bueno, man. No, thank you. Thank you, man. I just said, can I take you home? I don't know why I asked him that. Does he need to ride home? He has an apartment. Uh, he has nothing in his apartment. I didn't know that at the time. And he said, yes, yeah. so we got in the car. Somehow we David. figured this out. David, uh, mi amigo es, uh, hablas espanol. Oh, okay. Si. Kyle, how are you? Hey, Nicole, I'm good. How are you? Okay. You speak Spanish, right? Uh, a little bit, yeah. Hola, hola, ¿cómo estamos? <laughs> Muy bien, ¿y tú? Pues bien, gracias a Dios, conociéndolo a ellos dos ahorita. Oh, he said he's really thankful to meet you guys. ¿Tienes familia aquí o un trabajo? Pero aquí mismo no tengo familia. Un señor me está dando donde vivir porque no tengo trabajo, nada. Okay, yeah, he doesn't have any family or a job here. Okay, so he, he came here to try to find a job during all of this. Okay. How does he get, how does he pay for food? Uh, ¿Cómo pagar por uh, comida? Oh, la verdad que ando pidiendo en la calle. Uh, uh, he begs in the street. Okay. Uh, ask okay. him, hey, ask him if I can just, if I can just go get him, uh, oh man. Okay. Uh, a ask him if he's going to be here at his house later tonight. Okay. Um, si estás en tu casa... Este noche por Kyle va ven aquí otra vez. Uh, and so I remember that night, Laura and I, uh, I remember we actually went and we went and got groceries for him and just dropped him off at his house. Y pues sí, este, cuesta algunas veces con el discípulo porque pues las diferencias de cultura, la diferencia de, 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 de tradiciones que ellos traen. Entonces, eh, es más que nada es el tiempo y que uno persevere con ellos. Amen. You know, there are two things. One is being insulated and the other is being isolated. And as, as a Christian, I should be insulated. That is, the world outside must not be infecting me, but I cannot be isolated. I can be isolated, thereby also insulating me but that would defeat the very purpose why I am on planet Earth. I am to reach out to my neighbors. Often, we don't have the opportunity to see this person again. And we're trusting then that the impression that we made when we first met him will have a good effect on him. And I tell my students, even if they make no commitment to Christ, leave them with a good impression so that the next person who talks to you about Jesus will have an advantage that you have given him. It sometimes means we've got to overcome some impressions that have already been left by others. And that makes it difficult for evangelism today because we live in a world that's full of hypocrisy. 
if the church was living like Jesus intends us for living, we wouldn't have any problems in winning people to Christ because everybody would want to know that. We're called to make disciples of all nations, right? So it's discipling, you're discipling a non-believer, you're discipling a new believer, you're discipling a new believer um, to maturity in their faith, you're discipling a non-believer from lostness to encountering Jesus in their life is being transformed. So I would look at discipleship the same, almost the exact same way. Uh, you're taking a person from wherever they're at to a deeper pursuit of Jesus to where Jesus is more honored and glorified in their lives. And so, Like when we really love people, we want for them what God wants for them. Now, part of that is in Galatians 4.19, where the Apostle Paul is describing the churches in Galatia. And he's describing these, these disciples of his. And he says uh, that he's in the pains of childbearing until Christ is formed in them. And I think what he's describing is when you really love people and you really want people to be faithful to God and to grow up in the ways of Jesus, it can be really painful. One of our team members at Time Revive, she speaks fluent Spanish and we began to connect and identify and, and there was two young men that were able and willing to connect with David that speaks Spanish. Yeah. So he was walking and then he found you guys. Like He feels like God put, put you in his path because you fed him. And I mean, he was hungry that day. Yeah, yeah. sometimes he reads, but he like doesn't understand what it, what it means. So it'd be good for someone to explain to him. So would you be okay if Marco and Jonathan teach you what the Bible means? So estarías bien que te enseñáramos lo que significa todo en la Biblia? Sí, en serio que sí, en mi palabra. Awesome. Yeah, sometimes he gets discouraged because he doesn't have family. You know, he's with strangers, so you know he feels good that we're here to support him. No, porque a mí me duele por como le digo, él tiene su familia, me gustaría andar con mi familia. Sí. Pero porque uno es rechazado. Sí. Yeah, he says like, uh, you know, they have family down the street that they go visit, and he wishes he had that, you know, just to be with family right now. Well, thanks. For letting us come to your house today. Gracias por dejarnos a visitarte. Nada, me dio me crea. Y como le digo yo, dígale a él que él no espere nada de mí, pues, que Dios lo va a bendecir. Yeah, he says that God's gonna bless you because of what you did for him. Like, he may not be able to give back to you, but God will. It's the Lord, man. We're all in it together. Estamos todos juntos contigo. And so it was really that that the Lord really just connected my heart to him, and just like I want more for him. Yeah, I wanted him to grow in the Lord. But it wasn't just that, I wanted him to be taken care of. He's a human being that needed tangible things. Like even that first meeting with David and Jonathan and Marco. Like Marco takes off his jacket and gives David his jacket just right off his back. We left that day and I had gotten her information, the grandma Maxine uh, and the two moms. And uh, you know what's so cool is she, she wrote back and she said, I'd, someday I'd love to just do a Bible class with you. But sometimes, you know, I feel like I just want to give up because of my health issue, you know, and it's, it's stressing me. Well, you know, I got excited when you said, pray for me and then can we do a Bible class or something, you know? And because I think those are both great ways to get through this. Well, let me pray for you. Lord, thank you for this sweet sister. And God, I'm asking that tonight you just fill her cup up. You'd fill her up with your strength in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. When you're fighting this like giving up mentality, like I want you to see how to go to the word for it. Right? You surrender your life. Let's walk through what that looks like. The waves piled up all around the boat and began to fill it. It says they roused Jesus and asked if he cared that they were drowning. Do you ever get to that point with the Lord? Like, God, okay. don't you care? You know, I would say that all the time, you know, do you care? And then, you know, when I lost my son that day, you know, I'm like, I should have made this move. I kept blaming myself. I kept saying if I would have left, I thought, I'm, you know, uh, this wouldn't have happened. But it's, when it's your time, it's your time. So if I would have so left you, my... when you look back, though, you now see God's hand on this, get me out of there. Yes. That's one of the reasons I think our paths even crossed to show you that hope again. He believes in you. Question is, is do you believe that he can get you out of this? 
Yeah, amen. That's right. And so when you hear stories of tragedy, when you hear stories of suffering from somebody that, one, you didn't even know she lived down your road, two, she's a grandma, so she's obviously a different gender, three, she's black. She's got every kind of component that's not me. <laughs> and yet, she's got a foundation in Christ. Stephanie had never had chilies in her life. So we brought chilies, we sat in their back porch. Sayla Watts George, a five month old, right? Fed him fries, <laughs> so awesome. We opened up Project 52 and went through a Bible story about what does it mean to be fishers of men and are you willing to do this? And it just it established over, literally over chicken strips and chilies, right? Uh, a deeper hunger for the word. And I have no problem saying this. I think they're excited because we were bringing food. And I think they're excited because somebody wanted to pour into them. And I'm, I, you asked, Drew asked, or I asked, why did you do this? Why would you let us come? And I remember them saying, I don't know. <laughs> I thought it would be like, no one would ever do that. Nobody would ever do what? Come and like, like keep coming and having lunch. And mm -hmm. Like being consistent. Like consistent yeah. It makes me nervous. But at the same time, I'm glad that like, y'all are here because I need I need help, you know? And like, I did want to learn more about God and stuff like that, and I just never got around to it. So, this is kind of like a force that I want to do. That rocked my world because then it showed me we've got to stay consistent in this discipleship thing. So making disciples, one of the parts of the recipe is at least be consistent. So now Simon <laughs> is now being asked, I want you to go and catch your neighbor over there mm -hmm. and tell him about me. Instead of doing it with fish and worms and bait, I want you to go with this and I want you to catch men with the good news. It's a weird but cool image, right? Yeah. But in all reality, that's what happened with you guys. We went fishing for people and the Lord caught you. Do you get that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You gotta tell me the story as best as you can, what you think. What was the story we just read here? Simon couldn't catch fish, so I guess he felt hopeless yeah. in a way. And so something told him to go further out, which is just Christ. Right. And he went further and further and further until he actually caught fish. When he realized it was the Lord himself guiding him, got down on his knees and told him, I'm a sinful man. Then the Lord did not shame him about that. So he told him, since this happened, share the word. And when they came back to shore, they left the fish and shared the word. <laughs> wow. Cool. Okay, so check this out. What you did, see how it says share the story? Mm -hmm. Part of being a disciple is being able to tell the story. That's it. You don't have to actually open this up and be like, can I read now to you Luke 5? You know? Mm -hmm. No, you're like, hey, can I just tell you a cool story? Mm -hmm. You can do the same. So what I wanted to show you today was like in understanding discipleship, I want you to believe in yourself. Like I want you to believe in that those that live in 176 here, you can make disciples. You gotta believe in yourself that he's called you to do it. Do you believe that he's called you to do that, Stephanie? Oh, I'm so nervous. Do you believe that, Melissa? It's a process, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. He believes in you. And I think once you start letting go of the things that like you've identified with in the past, but he believes in you, you'll find that. You'll find that for you. Matthew 28, 19, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. You know, I, I, I wrestle with this text because I think in the Western culture, we love this scripture. We love it because it puts, it shows us what we need to do. So we have algorithms, programs, we, have attempted to define this is what that means. And then we have measurements of, well, there's this many people in church and we have this much money coming in and we're sending these people to the nations. And so we have ways to quantify this. 
Um, so it's a, a great question that needs to be answered. Um, but when I look at the church, I think this could be really confusing because there's so many expressions of it, both good and bad. But um, yeah, the Great Commission, it's, it's like the mantra for evangelicals. I don't think that our current models are gonna get us to where God really wants us to be because our current models are producing the results we're getting. So the average church with its programming and its systems was developed for a world that no longer exists. Pero yo creo que estamos en unos tiempos bien difíciles donde el evangelio eh, no se vive al máximo. Eh, falta de mucho compromiso en la iglesia. Es muchos creyentes que solamente son espectadores o, o les gusta el evangelio solamente escucharlo, pero no ponerlo en la práctica. En, en el en, en ser imitadores de Cristo, ¿verdad? I mean, I think the disadvantage of America is Christianity is easy here. Many, many places that come to Jesus and lose your family and lose your inheritance and but listen, pursuing Jesus is going to be worth every last second of your life and um, Jesus means everything to him. And so I think, and so discipleship has to move away from Hey, here are all the things that Jesus is going to give you to say, here's Jesus and here's Jesus alone. He's worthy of being pers pursuing. Somehow to say that if you cannot go, you should send is not right. Uh, while you're going, you should be sending as well. But to some extent, you should be going because if not, you won't even know what it's all about. So when you ask churches and pastors, are you making disciples? Almost every one of them says they are, okay? Uh, it's kind of like you sanctify anything. So if you have a group at your church and they're gonna take food to the homeless, that's disciple making. Now, let me just say it could be, okay? But as most churches are doing it, it's not an intentional relational uh, um, effort at disciple making. It's just, we're gonna feed the homeless. Or if you have a church service, that means because you're having a church service, you're making disciples. So what, what's happening in the United States is pastors are defining everything the church is doing as disciple making. And the problem with it is when everything is disciple making, nothing is disciple making. <laughs> you use the word do. I'm not sure if that's the proper word. If, if, you, if you looked at what they're doing, you wouldn't see very much discipleship. Uh, do, do has the idea of action. You're involved out there doing something that you can see. And I don't think the church today is fulfilling the opportunity to do more real discipleship. I feel that the church uh, is a multifaceted organization, you know, with eyes and ears and brain and hands and feet and Every, fun every part functioning well, but we just have two or three parts working. We have a foot here working, a hand here working, the eye works, but the rest is dragging along. And that's the tragedy uh, is if the church, the body of Christ in America would even for six months come, put their, get their act together, I don't think we would need to worry about who's the president and who's not. What we're doing is not working and it's not. On all kinds of statistics, the church looks just like the world in terms of morality, in terms of practices, and more and more in terms of beliefs. So what we're doing today is not working in terms of bringing people to Christ and helping people to become more and more like Christ and to make disciples like Christ. That's not the normative experience for people. And so you have to ask yourself, how are we? Get, if that's the norm that we want or that God wants, how are we going to get there? And I think the only way we're going to get there is to go back and say, how did Jesus do it? And how can we do it the way Jesus did it? The next meeting uh, it was where Drew and Rich and I were supposed to have lunch with Kelvin. Kelvin, about an hour plus before, wasn't able to make it. Spirit of God clearly said, still go to Chilosa. We go to Chilosa. We're standing outside uh, getting ready to leave. But I will say this, I remember praying, this was important for me, I remember praying for our meal, like the, the, the meal prayer. I remember praying that the Lord would bring somebody to us. 
Who is it? David. He's just walking past across the street. I just remember thinking, this is how it's supposed to work. The Spirit of God is just putting the pieces together. We just have to make ourselves available. We didn't do anything. We walked outside of a restaurant and there he was. Do you want to go and pray with me and talk to people? But in la casa, in house, nothing. There's nothing there. Yeah, let's just go. All right, let's do it. Awesome. No problem. It's the Lord. That is the Lord. It's awesome. Of course. How do we know that? Hang on, let me check real quick one thing. Hey, we're, uh, I live just down the street, literally a mile from the road. Uh, we literally go around our neighborhood and we, we just ask if we have a prayer request. So that's how I met him. Can you tell me your prayer, do you have a prayer request? Anything we can pray for you about? No. Nothing? Okay. All right, man. Sounds good, thank you. Have a good day. Don't be afraid to talk to them in Spanish and say hello and let them know that we're praying for people. Oh, okay. Okay. Okay, it's starting. Okay, good. Sí, está bien, ya. Okay, progress. We made progress. <laughs> okay, good. All right, good. Hang on, let me just see. What do you think, guys? Okay. Padre, bendícelo, Padre. Con tu sangre de Cristo, Padre, que tiene poder, Padre. I'll give you a hand. Hang on, David, I'm going to get it for you. Tomen, hay una Biblia ahí, no la comparten. Okay. El amarillo es pecado, se busca. Cristo murió por nuestros pecados. Sí. Es la dádiva de Dios. O sea, rojo es amor en Cristo Jesús. So, it's good. The red is amor. amor. Please tell him that the way a person experiences God's love is having faith in Jesus Christ. Cristo no trabajar. Amén. Así es que me entiende uno como no puede poner la, la, el corazón en otra cosa, no es que hay que tener fe en Jesucristo. Sí. Eso sí. es lo que ellos quieren sí. dar a entender. Sí. So, azul es fe. Ha confiado usted en Dios, en Jesucristo. Amén. 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 Gracias, sí. por la Es muy bonito. Sí, sí, sí. Oh, ahí está. Muchas gracias. Que Dios le bendiga. Ahí estamos. Did he say it perfectly? Maybe not. I don't say it perfectly. That's for sure. In fact, that day it was like just a fumbled mess. But God used David to walk people through the gospel. Did anybody say yes to the Lord? No. Did he ask to get prayed for, pray for people when they say no? Yes. But there was a hunger and almost like a belief that there's more for David in his life than just this identity of a lonely 17 year old kid with no family. Maybe for the first time, something deeper was established, which is a purpose. After that first time that uh, David went out on the streets with us, you know, he asked, can I go out with you again? When are you going to go out again? And, and so I said, all right, in a week, in a week, we'll, we'll take you out again. And, I mean, I think I'd, I would rather him Let's do it. go deeper than just, I, I want to do both. You got to go out and you got to go deeper. And we haven't done the discipleship side of things with David. And then I, I, I just felt prompted to talk to him about baptism. And uh, that didn't fit our plans of going out and sharing and praying. And in my mind, I'm like, God, does this count? You know, like we were talking about, I'm going to go out and share the gospel every day. But I, I, so we go back to this, like, do I have to do it this certain way? I, God has, there's freedom in following Christ. In the in moment preciso que tú ibas caminando, Kyle iba pasando y te vio. I said, I, I just want you to see how God is in the details of your life, that you are walking along that street. So was Kyle Martin. Yeah. Just would like to start on page 13, and it's talking about uh, baptism. Uh, I'm gonna read from Acts 2.42. Once people that heard the truth about Jesus, they then got baptized. Oh, sí, está bien. Yo nunca he sido he has never been baptized. Right, so that's why it's important to then express your faith in Christ through baptism. So baptism is a show that you have been cleansed. So ask him what he thinks it means to be a disciple of Jesus. It means to be a Christian before God. Amen. Amen. It also means to live 
like Jesus. This Sunday evening, would you like to get baptized? Yes, you have not been baptized. Do you like that? Why do you want to get baptized? He said that his family has always taught him things about the Lord. And although he is very young, he has the desire to be a disciple of Christ, so he would like to be baptized for that <laughs> Amen. Amen. Perfecto. Amen. Yeah. Perfecto. That's awesome. I was texting them, and all of a sudden she forgot that she had a, a dentist appointment with one of her kids. And so it's supposed to be at noon. So then right away I just thought, I'm not going to lose this chance on this scheduled day. So I just said, how about 4 o'clock, I'll bring you milkshakes. <laughs> I'll never forget. You know, four o'clock to me is a milkshake time, right? And they said, but what about the lunch? <laughs> you know, so we ended up bringing them the meal plus the milkshakes. Selah came, Laura came. And what I love about that was, is that Laura and I got to tag team as a couple in love on these two. I have a question. Sure. Are you guys like Christians or like Catholics or something? <laughs> You know, we're Christians. Christian. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was just. We were curious. Yeah. I was like, you asked. She's like, no, you asked. And I was like, I'm not gonna ask you. Asked. I have for. I have forgot. She brought it up to me one day, and I was like, I really don't know what they say. <laughs> do you still think this is? Do you still think it's weird that we keep showing up? No. I didn't want. Are you getting a little bit, a little bit more past the awkwardness, a little bit? Yeah. Just casual. <laughs> it takes me a while. I know. I can tell. <laughs> So my encouragement was is for you guys is one, we gotta teach you how to how to start reading this. Have you read this at all since last week? No, like every time I have it out, like my brother's like all up in my face trying yeah. to like snatch it from me. So. Yeah. It's okay. I've I, opened it like one time and like I haven't got it since. Yeah, that's okay. So we wanna help you learn how do you do this, where do you start, all that good stuff. When Jesus went to heaven, right, to be with the Father. When they left, then the disciples were okay, like, now what do we do? This right here is what they did. You see how it says the breaking of bread? Like, Laura, what's the breaking of bread? I just think like fellowship together, having meals together, um, being in community together, mm -hmm. living life together. Eating Chick-fil-A together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they didn't have Chick-fil-A back then though. So <laughs> they just had loaves of bread. <laughs> That's good, so go to the next paragraph where it says, as Jesus commanded, and it says, the apostles baptized every new disciple with water. Okay, so in Matthew 28, verse 19, Jesus gives, it would actually be you guys and us. He gives us a commission. And he says, all right, here's what I want you to do. Now that you know me, I want you to go tell somebody about me. And he says, go make disciples. What do you think it means to make a disciple? Got any ideas? Make a friend. Good. Okay. How do you? How, what would be that process? How do you make a friend? I would agree. Like introduce yourself. Okay. Good. Then what? What do you think you do to that after that? You talk to them. Good. You talk to them. You have to cook it all, bake it all. What's something you like to make? Like cake, cookies, muffins. Okay. This is gonna sound really dumb, but just go along with it. How would you make a cake? Look on the box. <laughs> <laughs> That's our kind of cooking in our okay. house too. <laughs> okay, good. So I'm already gonna keep going with you. You have to look on the box, keep going. Mm -hmm. Then what do you have to do? Uh, read the instructions okay. and then get the ingredients. Okay, good. So you would actually go get the ingredients. Mm -hmm. You have the instructions, you have the ingredients. Now what do you do? You put it all together. Good. Do you think that applies to making disciples? Yeah. What's your instruction box? The Bible. Good. What's the ingredients? The people. Good. And then what do you do with the instruction box and the ingredients? You make disciples. You got it. That makes sense? Not very smart. Oh. That was good. You got it. Mm. But you can't grow as a disciple unless you know what he's telling you to do. For people in discipleship to begin to come to their own conclusions, can only come from the Spirit of God, which means one thing to me. This is the part I get excited. Not only is she hearing it, she's understanding it. That's when you begin to see fruit in a person's life. And what I think was so powerful was, is that once we had gone through the Word, 
you know, we were talking about just their life and she has two kids, two year old and a five month old. And Laura spoke from a mama's heart. And when I was like, I look at you with a two year old and a four month old. And, and I remember those were really hard days for me as a mama, like very, like you're not like everyone needs you all the time and they're touching you all the time. Mm -hmm. And you're just like pouring out and pouring out and pouring out and no one's really pouring into you and you don't get the time you need or the sleep you need or the food you need or any of it. And so <laughs> I remember like those are some of the hardest times and I almost even didn't have time to spend with Jesus. Like I would just walk, I would have the Bible open on my kitchen table and I would just kind of like glance at it every now and be like, give me strength, Lord. <laughs> you know? But I mean, that's what it, it means. Like, like talking to him, like he, you know, receiving strength from him, just saying, Jesus, I need you. I'm and, really glad Laura could come today. Mm -hmm. Anything we can pray for you guys about today? I really want to pick. I want to pray for my friend. She has been struggling with the children. What? She does a lot for me. I am pretty tired. You want to pray over him? Yeah. Thanks for sharing. Right. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for today. Thank you for Alyssa and Stephanie. Lord, um, I just thank you for your word that gives us strength when we read it. Thank you for your Holy Spirit that dwells in us. and. Lord, I pray for strength for me as a mom, and um, I pray that you um, give her wisdom as she parents. And as Laura spoke from a mama's heart, she said, it's hard as a four-year-old, as, as four kids, this is hard. And so what happened is that instantly, not only, did, not only were we establishing our connection on food, not only are we connecting it on this, but now we're connecting on experiences. And in discipleship, that's part of it. Like, if you like sports, talk about sports. They're talking about being moms. And that was so huge. And then it just, it broke in Stephanie. Like, she lost it. Lord, in your name I pray, Jesus. Amen. 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 That was a lot. <laughs> Life can feel like a lot, but you are not alone. You're not alone. I studied the Word of God for two years straight. I taught Genesis through Revelation. Okay, for two years into a school. And over the course of time, you know what happens when you read the Bible and you study 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 and you study? You don't always go and do. A pastor has to reach a point of discontent with what's happening in, in the church. They have to just get to the point where they don't feel good about it and they know that they've got to make a change. And so the first thing that pastors have to do when they're trying to figure it out is they've got to commit themselves that they're personally going to make disciples the way Jesus made disciples. And that may mean that they keep preaching, they keep the programs going, but they're carving out time during the week so that they are investing in other people the way Jesus invested in his disciples. It is something that the church has to teach and push, but it's done at the individual level. If we say it's just something at church, it's gonna be catered around, hey, how do we disciple each other? How do we, but if discipleship is going to all the world and make the disciples is part of how you live your faith out, it's, hey, what are opportunities that God has given you? And that one-on-one -on -one is probably the most active part of it. Everything else is good, but that one-on-one -on -one I think is most important. And our people needs to be trained how to do it, the practical ways. So somebody can go through the whole discipleship lesson and then come to me and say, so how do I go and tell somebody about Christ now? So, so it really needs to boil down to something very, very simple. Hey, this is how you do it. And let me show you how, let's go. I think a lot of times in, again, our Western evangelical concept of church, discipleship is some type of program we're walking through. So when someone's converted, they come to the altar, they sign the card, then we have a, we have a, a plan for them. 
which isn't bad. We, we, need, we need plans, but oftentimes we fit them into, hey, you need to go to the 101. You need to become a member. You need to get baptized. You need to, in our, you get filled with the Holy Ghost. You start reading your word. And so we have all these measurements for them so that they can enter into discipleship. Uh, yeah, that's not how it plays out here. Discipleship is very relational. Jesus himself said, the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost, right? In, in Luke 19. So how can I be like the one who came to seek and save the lost, the one who made disciples, if I don't grow to the point where I'm seeking and saving the lost and making disciples myself? I'm not gonna be like Jesus. If I'm asking somebody in a local church to disciple them, I need to do it myself first. And so I didn't want this to feel like, hey, people are coming to know Christ, go to this church, go to that church, go to that church. Like I needed to get to know them and I wanted to make sure that wherever we got them connected, it was gonna be a growing experience. And the challenge is, is in discipleship, when you send people to the local church, many of them have never discipled people ever. So how can I give somebody a brand new person, a new person in the Lord and say, now you disciple them and they're not just as equipped as I was. I asked Kelvin the next, next week, hey, you wanna, you wanna meet up? And we had a scheduled date and he had begun to pack and move. And so he was last minute, just like, sorry, man, I'm not gonna be able to make it. So consistency just says, I'll ask him again. But I didn't, I didn't ask him every day. I didn't text him every day. I didn't call him five times a day. Like discernment just says, just give it time. So I asked him again the next week. He couldn't. So I tried it again. I was just like, hey man, you wanted to meet again next week. And uh, I think it was finally then that we met a third time and it was awesome. Here's what I was thinking. In the meantime, until you get in the groove, this is something I thought I could, man, I could just, I could share with you. Okay. Here's just a Bible story. That's it. But what's kind of fun is it has a summary of a story. Okay. It has random questions here. And then my favorite part is a guy from New York drew cartoons about every <laughs> Bible story. Okay. So if you could pick any story, one that looks somewhat intriguing. can be any one of them. Uh, demonic delivered. Okay, 89. Hey, you would happen to pick that one. Just like the exciting one. For years, the legion of demons had been energizing the self-destructive behavior that was both tormenting and killing the man while endangering anyone who came near. But with the power of the holy, life-giving spirit, Jesus sent the spirits of death into a herd of pigs. Oh, oh, I think I remember this one. It's a crazy story. The guy's yeah, in shackles. He's all the way over here. Jesus then speaks truth into this man. The demons have to flee and they get thrown into a herd of pigs. And then what happens? What happens to the pigs? The pigs uh, run down the mountainside and run off into the Sea of Galilee and drown. They mm -hmm. all run into the water. I mean, this is totally a stereotype of people, right? That person can't change. Obviously, this person is showing craziness, shouting, screaming, hurting people, whatever the context, full, full of demons. And these people just totally check them off. And next thing you know, he's totally different. And so like it says to me, Jesus can change anybody. And he can change any situation. So I think like for me, I get excited. Like this to me makes it real. You know, this here just sitting so I can get to know you, you can get to know us. Like that's what kills like all stereotypes. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. But if I don't have anything driving me to want to get to know you, who cares? I mean, you're a college kid. I mean, you're not the easiest guy to get a hold of. Well. <laughs> <laughs> but I believe in you that much that like, that's why I want to do this. You got a lot of potential. And you need people to keep, to tell, keep telling you, like, we believe in you. I mean, what guy wants to get an engineering degree, runs college track, right? Yeah. I mean, that's pretty special. And you probably don't have a whole lot of influences in your life. You're driving yourself. By the way, that's the story. You can tell that story to anybody now. You know a Bible story from Mark 5 that says this is how a person has been set free. Yeah, I can show it to him. And you can show it to him. That's right. It's kind of fun, isn't it? Yeah, it's pretty cool actually.
Hey, can I ask you a quick question? Sure. You have like 30 seconds. Uh, 30 seconds. We're closing up right okay. now. You got 30 seconds. Tell him the story in 30 seconds. Try it. Ready? Go. Go. Okay, so March, March 5, um, the story of a man that had a lot of demons in him. He was very troubled. No one would really think he would change. And uh, the, the truth was spoken into him. The demons fled him, uh, jumped into some pigs. The pigs killed themselves. Uh, everyone realized he was a changed man because his appearance and uh, he told him. That's it. Yeah. That's the end of the story. Have you ever heard that story? Uh, uh, I think you've just proved church doesn't need to be an hour long. There's <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of pomp and circumstance going on. <laughs> Good job, that was the fastest, uh, fastest I ever heard it. That's the best sermon, right? I, like I've that. come to his sermon, yeah. Hey, do you know who set the, the guy free, right? That's all we need. Yes, <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Thanks for listening. All right, see ya. Just told a guy about demons that went into pigs. <laughs> you do like a challenge. It's yeah. awesome. Well, let's try to do it again next week. Fridays are always good. Oh yeah, for sure. Gotta try to keep that maybe on your just roughly. And I mean, I'll, t I'll touch base with you, but. Okay, yeah, I should be able to make this one like for sure, for sure this time. All right, fine. Does it happen where people fade away? Absolutely. Absolutely. Is it crushing personally? Yeah. Not because of performance, but because I want to see him grow. And then when you don't hear from them, you don't see them. I have a list of people for 31 days. I have a list of people that never responded back to me. To find a person who is like a, a sponge, uh, just believes everything you say and does anything you ask him to do. Those are rare. But if you find one, be careful because what you say they will practice. You're on the spot. For me, it's, a, it's proximity. The, I can't disciple the world. I'm gonna disciple a select few. Jesus only had 12. In a few of those relationships, we regularly study the word in a structured manner, but there's a lot of them that um, it, it, it's just our flow of life. When issues arise, I'm discipling them through their stuff. Um, it's messy. What is more important than to deal with real lives of real people and the, the, the kingdom of God in their lives and of helping them to deal with their struggles, their sins, the demonic elements in their lives. You're helping them to deal with those things and to find the power of God that their lives, as the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians 3, would be transformed from one degree of glory to the other by the power of the Holy Spirit working in you in discipling relationships. Most people whom God is reaching out come bundled up in a lot of troubles. And uh, you just have to unbundle that and you find there is amazing work God is doing. That desire to learn of God is by the Spirit. And if they don't have that desire, you cannot manufacture that desire. You can have all kinds of entertainment and you can do sensational things, work all kinds of magic, but the desire to learn of God is planted in the heart by God. It's by the Holy Spirit. Whenever people really want to make disciples, even if they do it the wrong way, but their intent is good, that the Holy Spirit will work in that and use it. You won't have disciple making apart from the power of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God has to empower me to speak and I love on a complete stranger. That's only of the Lord. And that, that comes from Christ working in my life. Gosh, I'm, I'm not seminary trained or I don't have this kind of education. I mean, that's what people think, right? I don't have enough answers to provide what they need. And I would just say, join the club. That's kind of the realness of walking with the Lord. You just say, well, if I don't know, we're gonna find out. God made you for great things. Like you may not think he's made you for great things, but he's made you for great things. And the greatest mission on planet Earth is the mission to be a disciple who makes disciples. You will literally change people's eternal destiny. Imagine that, that God has called you and given you the opportunity to help people go to heaven instead of hell because you're gonna love them with the love of Jesus 
and disciple them into the gospel and other people, God's given you the opportunity to help them be who God wants them to be. How's it been? How many kids do you have? Well, I have two and one on the way. Two, and she just found out she's pregnant with her third. How old are you? I'm 19. That's a lot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What are some things that we've done to get to know you? Uh, talk was one of them. Um, we went out to eat a couple of times. Yep. Had chilies for the first time ever? Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to get my driver's license right now, and he's trying to help me out get my driver's license. So, well, both of us, we're trying to get it soon, so. So what does that look like? Seriously, what is that, how do we help you do that? What have you already done? Verbally and physically helping us. Like, he'll talk about it, and then he'll actually give me papers to read over so I can actually do it myself to, like, make appointments and stuff, so. And if I can help her get the things that she needs physically and spiritually, that's what Scripture talks about, making disciples. Humbly asking you, Father, to watch over Stephanie. Mm -hmm. We'll give her the wisdom that she needs mm -hmm. to just continue to press. It's like that for all of us, Lord. And we just thank you for your presence, for the Holy Spirit, for Jesus, and for your guidance. In Jesus. Amen. 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 And I would say that that's the addiction of the American church. We want to fast track disciples. Uh, you know, we want to uh, just make them overnight. And the truth of the matter is a lot of people think once you're converted, you're already a disciple. And uh, it's sad because for a lot of people, they think conversion is the finish line, where to me, conversion is the, in many ways, the starting line. Because once you commit your life to Christ, then there's all the, the work of growing up and maturing in Christ. And I have just, in my observation is there's not a, there's not a way to fast track it. Can't microwave it, that it's more of a crock pot approach. I think the church has really been influenced by corporate structures, corporate goals. And, and so we like quantifiables, we like measurements. And I'm learning that discipleship and the fruit of discipleship, it, it needs to be measured over years and decades of people that we've walked with. Find people like that that have that desire to learn. Find them early when they're still young, if you can. That's why children learn so fast. They don't have a lot of prejudice yet built into them. They'll quickly acquire it. But learn people who have a desire to learn and invest largely in those people who have that desire because that's not what you've done. That desire is put in their heart by God. That's the Holy Spirit. That's grace. I think discipleship has to be unto knowing the Lord. So it's, and, and that may seem like, duh, but, but oftentimes, oftentimes discipleship is about, um, it, we can fall short of that. We, we, can, we can tell people what to think. We can, we can tell people what to do. And yet they may, look like they're disciples on the outside by all the things that they're doing, but it's not unto them knowing Jesus. And discipleship is not, it's not, you can't plan it. You have to love it and live it. It's dirty, it's messy, it's uncomfortable, it's expensive. It takes away time from my schedule. That's why I haven't done it. And the shift for the church, like honestly, it needs to come when we are willing to make disciples. It's not a condemnation, to be honest. I think it's just a reality check for me. And if you wanna see a church grow, go out. Tanaya, do you remember when we came and gave these? You do? You do?
Here, I'll sit down. Okay, so you, got, you got one of these, right? Did you get one of these? Here, sit down. You never got one? That's what I was looking on my phone. Because I was like, you take this. Do you want it? There are some people here that went through the book, but you didn't get to. Would you like to? Okay, so here, can I give you my wristband too? You didn't even get one of these, did you? You know what would be really cool? Is if you, you want your grandma to tell you this? Can I do that? All right, come on, come over here. Come on. Part of my encouragement for you. Okay, you ready for this? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you get to show her what each one of these means. <laughs> All right? I know this one means that. You're right, okay, so the yellow one, let's go to the yellow one. So, if you want to read that one. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Okay, so the yellow stands for what? Do you remember we all do it? Sin. You got it. Okay, so you got to remember. Yellow is for sin, okay? Do you think your grandma sometimes sins? <laughs> grandma, you better answer that. Yeah. So, we all do. We all do. We all do. That that why we were yet yes. sinners. sinners. Yeah. Christ. Christ died for us. This says. Now your grandma's gonna know this. I know it. Do you remember what the red word is? Christ. We'll take it. That's good. What did, what did Christ do for us? He died for us. Jesus, did he come back to life? He did. Look at you. So in order to have eternal life, what that means, Tanaya, is if you want to be with God forever, then this Bible verse tells you how. You have been saved through faith. Through faith. Through faith. If you have faith in Christ, you still get to go to heaven, and your life can change today. Do you have wings? You don't, probably. Not that I know of. But it's still kind of fun to think about. But the only way you even get to be in heaven and be with God, if God. is if you have faith, faith in Jesus. Does that make sense? Okay, Tanaya, if you said out loud, Jesus, I want you to be in charge of my life. And what that means is from now until you physically die, you want Jesus to help you. When you hear that Jesus is Lord, would, would you like him to be in charge of your life? Do you believe that, what do you believe about Jesus? When you hear all this, what do you believe? I believe that he died and then he came back to life. It doesn't mean your life's gonna be the best. Would, I, would you agree? I agree. It just means you have hope now to get you through it. Do you believe that Jesus is your Lord? Why don't you just say that out loud? I believe Jesus is my Lord. No. Do you believe that he died and came back to life? Do you believe that he forgives you of your sins? I remember seeing this huge billboard and outside of Charlotte, North Carolina, and it said, um, making disciples, making disciples, who are making disciples, who are making disciples. And I remember thinking that billboard came to my mind at that moment. <laughs> and I just remember thinking, man, Grandma Maxine is beginning to make a disciple with her granddaughter. Our understanding may be very limited as you start out as a baby, but it'll grow. It grows very quickly those first few years. The biggest reward is you know that you are obeying Jesus who gave his life for you. Um, you're, the results of that is in his hands. Um, the call is obedience, and you, you know that as you're living faithfully, you get to hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. And then when we see the people we've invested in go out and invest in other people, it's like, that is the best thing. Like, what's better? I think baptism is a crucial part in discipleship. I think Jesus mentioned making disciples, baptizing them, uh, because that, that act, the act of being baptized, is us losing rights to our life. And, and we are now, our life is His, and we are going to follow Him. We are going to be disciples of Jesus. Baptismo. Baptismo. Oh, in, ah. in el, el agua. Ah, agua. So Jesus to him is 
the one who came and died on Calvary for his sins. And so we praise you for this baptism today. Te alabamos, Señor, por este bautizo en este día. Thank you for cleansing this brother of his sins. Gracias por haber limpiado este hermano de sus pecados. Bless my brother as he takes this leap of faith, declaring he's a disciple of yours. Bendice a mi hermano con este paso de fe que él toma para ser tu discípulo. So I baptize you now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. No, pues me siento bien feliz, ¿me entiende? Porque nunca lo he hecho, pues, ¿me entiende? Como le digo, tal vez en mi país no me da la oportunidad, pues. He feels so happy right now in this moment, and he doesn't think that he would have been able to have this opportunity in his country. You see him coming out with like a new robe, a robe of righteousness. Like, you begin to see 31 days is worth it. And you begin to process. Man, I'm so thankful for the Maxines. I'm so thankful for the Kelvins. I'm so thankful for the Stephanie and the Alyssas. And I'm thankful for the people that said no, to be honest. I'm thankful for the people that heard the gospel that said, no, I don't want this. And it was just kind of like all of this was just in that water as I'm walking down. I was just like, man, I remember praying on my bathroom floor saying, man, the Lord was right. He knew what he was doing. This isn't just for David, this is for me. And to see him come out and then we had fellowship in my backyard just had some pizza and hung out. And then we, what did we do? We heard his story. More of his story that completely rocked my world. I knew most of the time he was by himself. Every day. That's what bothered me the most. <laughs> and I think at that, at that moment, I knew that my love for the lost was back. And it only happened because I went out. I can see my kids now, oh, there's dad crying again. <laughs> but these are tears of compassion that finally came back because I was living it out. And discipleship is not, it's not, you can't plan it. You have to love it and live it. And the judgment of Christians, mentioned over in Corinthians, our works are tried as by fire. If you want to know if something is true metal, put it to the fire. If it's true, that fire will only purify it and make it more beautiful. 31 days of hitting the streets in my own neighborhood, praying, getting rejected, going to people's homes, getting food, baptism, teaching. When it all comes back, it's Matthew 28, 18 through 20. It's the four words to Jude. Go, make disciples, baptize, and teach. And every one of us can do this. Can you imagine if we begin to live this in our own neighborhoods, you wouldn't need massive events. You wouldn't need massive campaigns. You'd have a group of obedient, spirit-led believers radically changing our neighborhoods. That's when you'll see revival. Revival comes when we live out this. And I saw it in my own life. I have <laughs> I've been revived. I've fallen in love again with Jesus. And I long for that for as many people in my own neighborhood as possible. 
And my prayer is that it becomes contagious. That other people will want to live like this in their own life. Thank you.